In this game, Richard Reti demonstrated the ideas of hypermodernism at their best. Namely, he let his opponent build a pawn center and then destroyed it in a very creative way. The position opened up after that, and it turned out that Reti's pieces were much better prepared for the open battle. The game ended with a spectacular interference tactics and was awarded the first brilliancy prize. Reti started with knight f3, playing the opening which was later named after him, namely the Reti opening, of course. After d5, he played c4. Now we can see the idea of the Reti opening. White lets black build a pawn center and then attacks it with his own pawn and fianchettos both of his bishops, exerting pressure on the black pawn center with his pieces. So, Bogolyubov, Reti's opponent in this game, plays e6 in order to defend his uh, central pawn. However, the pawn on e6 is blocking the light squared bishop, and the bishop is bad. However, black is thinking about playing e5 later in the game, the liberating move, after which the bishop, the light squared bishop, would turn into a good piece. Reti plays g3, knight f6, bishop g2, bishop d6, taking under control the e5 square and still thinking about e5, of course. Short castle, short castle, b3. Reti is going to fianchetto to his bishop and take under control the e5 square too. Rook e8, supporting the e pawn, so black is preparing e5. Bishop b2, preventing e5, and knight d7. Now the knight controls the e5 square too. And black, it seems that black is ready to play e5. That's why Reti makes a strong move d4 preventing black from playing e5. Bogolyubov plays c6, reinforcing his center and still thinking about e5. And Reti makes a strong move, knight d2. It might look like knight c3 was a more natural move because the knight is more actively placed on c3. However, as the game will show, the knight has more prospects on the d2 square. Besides that, the knight isn't closing the dark squared bishop's diagonal on d2, which wouldn't be the case if the knight was on c3. What to do now? If black makes the cherished move, e5, that would lead to the uh, emergence of the isolated pawn on d5 after the mass exchanges, first on d5 and then on e5. As you see, black has the isolated pawn on d5. And now we can see why the knight is better placed on d2. White has a strong move, knight c4, attacking the rook, and the knight is untouchable, of course, because the pawn on d5 is pinned. The rook will be forced to retreat, and after that, knight e3, and white pieces attack the isolated pawn. And after bishop e6, defending the pawn, white would simply play queen d4, blockading the pawn, and vacating the d1 square for the rook, attacking the pawn for the fourth time, and black's position would be critical. Probably it would have been better to play queen e7, which was suggested by Savelli Tartakover. So, after queen e7, black still thinks about e5, and also the queen is supporting the bishop, and black can play bishop a3, which would lead to the exchange of the dark squared bishops, and that might decrease white's pressure. However, instead of this, black made a seemingly active move, knight e4. But, as the game will show, that was a dubious decision, because red is simply captured on e4. And after d takes e, it might seem that black has a strong pawn on e4. It has crossed the center and exerts pressure on white's position. However, this pawn is rather a weakness than a strength. Reti plays knight e5. He starts immediate play against the pawn. Now, the pawn is under attack. But Bogolyubov plays f5, defending it. But... Reti plays f3 and he attacks this pawn one more time and is threatening simply to win a pawn after f takes e, f takes e and bishop takes e4. So black is forced to give up this strong pawn. f takes, e takes f. And now Reti made another strong move. Instead of e takes f, he captures on f3 with the bishop because he needs the pawn on the e file as he's going to play e4 which would lead to the opening of the center. And as you see, black pieces are very bad. The bishop is still bad, it's limited by its own pawn, the queen side isn't developed, and black pieces are cramped. And while white pieces are very active, white has two great bishops on the long diagonals, white has the central centralized knight, white has uh, more space, 
So that means the opening of the center will definitely be in white's favor, because white pieces are much better prepared for the open battle. So what to do now? If black captures on e5, then simply d takes e, bishop c5 check, king g2, and if black finally develops the queen side, tr thinks, uh, tries to think about the development of the queen side, then white will still play e4, and after that white will open up the center and will get rid of the doubled pawns on the e-file. That's why after bishop takes f3, Bogolubov plays queen c7, exerting more pressure on the knight. However, Reti simply exchanges on d7, and after bishop takes d7, plays e4. With a terrible threat, namely e5, which would lead to a terrible squeeze, after which the active bishop will be forced to retreat, and black pieces will be even more cramped. And after that, after e5 and the retreat of the bishop, then white will get even more space by playing d5. Or white can also think about the attack on the king side by playing g4. Both of these options were suggested by Alyokhin in his book dedicated to the tournament in, the, in New York. So white is threatening to play e5 with a terrible squeeze. That's why Bogolubov prevents it by playing e5 himself. However, this leads to the immediate opening of the center, and that would be fatal for black, as you will see. Reti first plays c5, pushing away the active bishop. The bishop retreats to f8, and now another strong move. At the moment, white cannot capture on e5, because the pawn on d4 must defend the pawn on c5. If white captures on e5, then c5 will fall. Bishop takes c5 with check. That's why Reti plays queen c2, defending the pawn. And queen c2 is actually a double attack. As the pawn on c5 is defended, white is threatening to capture on e5. Besides that, the queen on c2 is also attacking the f5 pawn. White is simply threatening to capture on f5 with a pawn. So both of these pawns are attacked. What to do? If f takes e, then simply bishop takes e4, still with the double attack. h7 is under attack, and e5 is under attack. That's why after queen c2, Bogolubov captures on d4, and Reti captures on f5. So, the pawn is still under attack. White is simply threatening to capture it. That's why Bogolubov plays rook d8, indirectly defending the pawn. If white captures now on d4, that would have been a mistake because of simple bishop takes f5 with the discovered attack on the bishop. That's why Reti first makes a strong move. Bishop h5, attacking the rook, and only after the rook moves to e5, he now captures on d4, attacking the rook. That's why Bogolubov captures on f5, and that leads to the mass exchanges. Rook takes f5, bishop takes f5 with the uh, discovered attack on the bishop, queen takes f5, and rook takes d4. And a strong but simple move, bringing into the play into play the last uh, piece, which isn't doing anything, with great effect, rook f1, creating terrible pressure on the f-file and creating an immediate threat. Queen takes f8, checkmate, so the bishop is under attack. What to do? The bishop, of course, cannot capture on c5 because it's defended. If the bishop moves to e7, for example, that would lead to immediate checkmate after queen f7 check, forcing the king to the corner, and simply, of course, checkmate in two moves would fall. What else can uh, black do? If queen e7, in order to defend uh, the bishop, then simply bishop f7 check, king h8, and a strong move, bishop d5 with the interference, interrupting the rook. Now the rook cannot uh, move to d8 in order to defend the back rank and the bishop. And white is still threatening to capture on f8 twice with the checkmate. And if queen f8, for example, to prevent the, this, then simply queen c8 with the discovered attack on the queen. And also if the queen retreats, if it moves, then the catastrophe on uh, f8 would follow. That's why after rook f1, Bogolubov plays rook d8 in order to defend the back rank and the bishop with his rook. However, now the game ends in two moves, although it's hard to believe.
You can pause the video and try to find Retis combination. I will give you a small tip. There are two main motifs of this combination. First, the back rank checkmate, and second, the interference tactics. So, the first move is bishop f8, f7 check, forcing the king to move to the corner, and now the back rank checkmate issues are very serious. And the second move, the interference, bishop e8. So, interrupting the rook, now the rook isn't defending the bishop, and white is simply threatening checkmate in one. Queen takes f7, and there is nothing black can do. The bishop is under attack. Uh, if the bishop moves, white will still play queen f8 check, followed by rook takes uh, rook uh, takes f8 checkmate. If black captures the bishop, white will still capture on f8 with checkmate next move, and black cannot defend the bishop with the queen either for the same reason: double capture on f8 and checkmate. That's why Bogolubov resigned. And now I recommend watching a game in which Capablanca violated the conventional principles in order to carry out his plan, creating a strategic masterpiece. But first, like this video and subscribe, as it's really helpful for the channel growth.